No, 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 no. Hello? GDP, what the fuck? No, not today, not today. I'm not happy about this any more than you are. Okay, so, needless to say, things are not good right now with the Dallas Mavericks. Things are, in fact, very bad. Very, very, very bad. How bad? I came into this stretch of the week still cautioning that while I thought reinforcements, a funny word to use, a questionable word one might suggest to use, while I thought their return would provide a bit of a emotional lift, it's surprisingly added nothing. Now, here's the thing. In my heart of hearts, I don't believe the Mavericks are this bad. I don't. I, I refuse to believe they are this bad. But whether or not they are this bad is immaterial. What matters is how they're playing. And how they're playing is uninspired, lacking energy, sloppy, disinterested basketball. This is a major problem. I, I cannot believe that a team with Luka Doncic and Kristaps Porzingis is forcing me to say this, but it's hard watching the Mavericks right now because I, I can't piece together how badly they're playing. Like, I'm trying to put something together here to to process this there's a few points i wrote over here on the board obviously something something is broken yes it's a brutal schedule yes they've had a difficult difficult stretch i still cautioned that i thought this was going to be a really really rough week for them but i never imagined that the wheels would fall off the way that they have and it's another case of them making a push too little too late in these games and it's it's absolutely permeated throughout this locker room now you have guys who are now very much frustrated disappointed just baffled trying to figure out how exactly to fix things the mavericks have lost seven out of nine they're three games below 500 and they've got major issues now we'll have some stats and stuff here to kind of give some context to that the offense has remained in the gutter we'll have some specific stats to try and explain what's happened to the offense and i know a lot of people uh, i've seen a few people in the comments pointing out like this is what happens when you trade seth curry uh, guys i've got to tell you <laughs> i'm a huge seth curry fan Seth Curry is not the reason the three-point shooting left this team. It's not. He's not. It, it, it's not the problem. Richardson missed nine games because of COVID. It's not nearly comparable in that regard. He's better than what we've been able to see. He's fresh off of COVID. You have to understand it's going to take time to ramp up and get back into any kind of swing or flow that he needs. Man, my camera is just tripping balls on this focusing in and out thing. So, with that being the case, we've got to address some other issues with this team. The belief was this team was going to become a defensive-minded squad. And I applauded the offseason moves they made, the draft picks that they got, and I thought, you know what? This makes sense. You surround Luka with guys who can defend, and who can shoot, and you got it. 
Right now, neither of those things are happening. At least as a team, the team defense is in the tank. I know Utah's really good. They've won 11 straight now. They are very good. And I said, going into the first matchup with Utah, that they there's a reason they're one of the teams that has separated themselves from the pack. But, man, oh, man. This is, uh, this is brutal. Like, Porzingis coming off the knee, he suddenly looks very unsure of himself. He looks very lacking in confidence. He's getting pushed around. He seems like he's a bit afraid of contact, and he's just laying a house. He's house. He's habitat for humanity out there on the perimeter, laying down bricks. Like, he can't buy a bucket right now. And this is a problem. His first half was three points, three rebounds, zero blocks, and three fouls in 14 minutes of action. That's your Robin to Luca's Batman. That is substantial in terms of problems for this team. I'm not laying it all on KP, but it's a big part. The defense, even with these guys coming back, and by the way, when Maxi gets back, it's not going to fix this. Whenever Maxi comes back, it's not going to fix this. He's not going to magically wave a wand and fix this defense or this team. He'll help, but he won't fix this. So what Dallas has to do is figure out how to find that competitive spirit in itself and pull itself out of the uh, off the mat, you know? Cuz they got to play again tonight and they got Phoenix. It's not easy. Not easy at all. And the quick turnaround, they got back into Dallas at 3 a.m. It's 10:20 in the morning as I record this. They got back to Dallas 7 hours ago and they play tonight. They're not going to be fully rested. They're not going to be fresh. The only thing they have, at this point, if you're playing for your pride, fine. That's about the only fire you got right now is just to try and prove you're not as bad as you've looked the last couple games, as you've looked the last stretch of basketball. And uh, like I said, it's permeating throughout the locker room because even guys who are you know, integral to this team the leaders of this team are kind of questioning its heart right now. And this is very problematic if you're trying to actually build towards something or compete. Luca in 32 minutes last night had 25 points, 6 rebounds, 7 assists, 8 of 17 shooting, 2 of 6 from 3, 7 of 10 at the line, and a steal. Porzingis, 25 minutes, 11 points, 9 rebounds, 4 of 14 from the field, 1 of 5 from 3, 2 of 3 at the line. Porzingis got to the line a lot more often last year. He's stepped back in that regard, and I, th I think that's another thing I talked about with, I hinted at earlier with him looking like he's getting bullied a little bit, like he's afraid of the physicality. I don't know. I mean, his injury was from contact, and so maybe he's thinking about contact a little bit. That's, uh, that's concerning if that's the case. Other standouts, or rather not standouts here, Josh Richardson lays an egg. Six points, two rebounds, two assists, uh, three of eight from the field, 0 of three from three. That's not great. Um, plus minus isn't end all be all. I don't think there was a single Maverick. Oh, you know, Dwight Powell was a plus one. You had Green and like the the scrubs who were like plus three, plus four. But uh, yeah, it was bad. It was bad because you had. Bogdanovich going for 32 points in 32 minutes. The fact that they have him and Ingles on, on Utah is almost just unfair. Uh, Ingles, he torched us the previous game, but he was 10 points, 4 and 4 in 28 minutes last night. Gobert, another 17 and 12, very casual, kind of getting whatever he wanted in that regard against Dallas. And uh, Clarkson off the bench, 18 and 6. Like, they continued to pretty much get what they wanted. Dallas had no fight in this game. Dallas was down in this game. Something, and the first quarter was the most almost unwatchable experience of Mavericks basketball I've seen in I don't even know how long. Hey, let me see here. I want to find the exact call out. I thought I had a note of it. It was like 43 to 16 in the first quarter. 
I mean, or maybe that was the start of the second quarter, but it was it was brutal. This team had nothing. It was embarrassing watching this team. And I hate saying that. I absolutely hate saying that. But, you know, them's the facts. They they didn't look like they wanted to be there for most of the game, like they weren't ready to compete. And now we do have to start raising a question of, and I've pushed back against this narrative for a long time. I still think he's a good coach, not a great coach, but I think he's a good coach. But I think you have to start entertaining the question of is Rick Carlisle losing this team? I think there's a stance every year, it seems like lately, the last few years, where we have to kind of question that, where the team looks really, really bad for a stretch or just is getting embarrassed and they have to have a players-only meeting. They have to really lay into the guys to try and figure out what exactly is going wrong. What is the cause of what's happening? And they usually do respond, but with the change in identity this year that the Mavericks tried to do in the off season, the problem there was that you were trying to basically say, all right, we've never been a, not never, we haven't been in years a good defensive team. We're going to try and build ourselves back into that model, which we were in the past under Carlisle. We're going to try and rebuild that type of team. And if it sacrifices some on the offensive end, it's fine. The trade-off will be worthwhile. Well, here's the thing. The offense went in the absolute toilet, and the defense hasn't come around. And so you have to wonder, is this team kind of looking a little bit with a side eye at Rick Carlisle and thinking, you know, it's hard to believe you when you say that because despite us buying in and trying to do what you're saying, it's not coming together right now. The defense is nowhere near where it needs to be. And the offense has fallen the hell off the side of a cliff. And there are specific stats you can point to on that here. This is from, let me find it. This is from Jake Kemp uh, on Twitter. He throws out a bunch of breakdowns here uh, regarding the offense specifically. So he's comparing last year's offense to this year's offense. He says, this is all offensive stuff. And most of it matches the eye test. Basic first passes per game. 2019 to 20 season, they were 17th. This year, they are 26th. So significantly fewer passes per game. Interesting. Ball's moving less. Everything else is uh, less movement as well. Not just passes, but off-ball screens per game. They were 7th last year. They are 13th this year. Uh, Let's see. And yet it seems like they are still getting a pretty decent amount of good looks. This is also true. Per Spectrum's shot quality metric, in 2019-20, they were 13th in quality shots per game. This year they are 15th, so a little bit of a dip there. To support this further, he says, creating open catch-and-shoot opportunities are the goal. And the percent of Mavs catch-and-shoot jumpers considered unguarded in 2019-20? It was 16th. This year, it's actually gone up. It's 13th. That means they are generating even more good looks, unguarded, wide-open looks this year than they were last year. You're generating more, and you're converting significantly fewer. One of the worst, if not the worst, three-point shooting team in the league right now. And uh, that is a recipe for disaster, especially when you live and die off the three because you have no scoring in the paint game right now so they're passing less he says screening off the ball a bit less yet still creating the same quality uh, same shot quality and amount of open looks but as you've likely observed slash guessed the efficiency has fallen off a cliff points per possession on unguarded catch and shoot attempts it was 1.268 last year it is 1.027 this year that's significant drop off He says, not trying to be a make or miss league kind of guy, but this is, (laughs) he's like, 
This is a gross watch right now, but you traded your best shooter to improve on D. A few of your other good shooters have been out and now have to work back in or are still out with no practice and limited shoot arounds, blah, blah. That's literally what his tweet says, blah, blah. I'm not saying I'm upset that I'm not upset about it. Just trying to give some context rather than screaming, fire Rick, Luca's leaving, wave KP, Cuban sell the team, etc. Oh, and last thing, KP, there's no doubt he's struggling to find his form. And for sure, we have to say that too often, and that's a concern. I fully agree on that. He's not very good right now, but only AD, Cat, and Christian Woods are averaging same or better points, rebounds, blocks, lines this year. Three players. Obviously, he's been the least efficient. This is, the, I think, the last tweet in the thread. Obviously, he's been the least efficient of that group, but not by any crazy amount. That's because he's shooting it way better on two-point field goals than he ever has. In my opinion, the only, it's really only about hitting a few more open threes and playing with Maxi on defense. That's what he says on that. That's his kind of assessment. And I understand what he's saying. I also think there's a lot of validity to the fact that we are having to have this conversation. And it's only KP's second season with the Mavericks actually playing. But we are having to, it feels like, way too often talk about how he's not in a rhythm. We got to wait for him to get in a rhythm. When he does, when he's there, when he's locked in, the dude is a monster. He's the unicorn. And when he's not, eh, he's a guy. He's a guy with a pulse. Playing with Maxi will help. I do believe that. I think Maxi is a very underrated defender, not just perimeter, but in general. And just like it, we talked about, it would help Willie Cauley Stein. It'll help KP. But again, that's not going to fix everything. Um, the Jazz in this game shot 44% from the field, 42% from three. Anything they wanted. 92% at the line on 26 attempts. You're not going to beat that. They did turn it over 15 times compared to just 11 for the Mavericks, but it didn't matter because they were blowing them out. Assists, they won that edge. Rebounding, they crushed by 16, including 17 on the offensive boards. That's terrible. That's ridiculous. Five blocks to four, eight steals to six. Same, same number of fouls, basically. This was just an ass-kicking, and it's a concerning one because it was the least engaged one that we've seen. Let's see here. Yeah, so my screenshot I was talking about earlier, the 44, 43 to 16, that was with 9.57 in the second quarter. So Dallas was getting absolutely thumped in this game, and it was brutal brutal to watch. My big concern, my big takeaway here was post game. And I'm going to try and include that clip here. Luka Doncic post game is very visibly not in his typical character here um in terms of his leadership kind of role in this team. Usually Usually, I think he plays things a little close to the vest, and here I felt like he he let some things not slip. I think he just was more open about his frustrations. He says, right now the Mavericks are, quote, terrible. There's really not much to say. I never felt like this. We've got to do something because this is not looking good. We've got to step up and just talk to each other and play way better than this. It's mostly effort. Yeah, yeah. He goes on to say, like, I know we will, and that's all that matters, but it's that first snippet that I think people are really running with here. And, you know, it's uh, it's hard not to. It's hard not to look at that and say, there's major things that have to be fixed. To give some context as well, though, to the opponent and why it was like running into a buzzsaw these past two games... As I said, the Jazz have the longest winning streak in the NBA right now at 11 games. Nine straight games with 15 plus threes. That is the second longest streak in NBA history. And they made 265 three-pointers in the month of January, which is also second most in a calendar month in NBA history. The Jazz are just firing on all cylinders right now, and they don't even need to beat most teams right now, Donovan Mitchell. 
that's that's how good they are. They are a complete team anchored with a rim protector and a, an elite perennial defensive player of the year caliber player. And they are s- surrounded by great shooters and defenders. And they have a great coach, a great coach. So I don't know what to say on that front, man. It's a, uh, it's a it's a very tall measuring stick to have to to have to measure up to in your lowest moment. But if this is rock bottom for the Mavericks and they can climb up, okay. It's still the first third of the season. You've got time. If it's not rock bottom, if this is going to keep getting worse or just be more of this just stretched out longer, then you do have to start having major considerations about this because as as staunch a defender as I've been about this team and their potential and what I still think they can do, the fact that I still think they can beat most any team, most any opponent, that I still think they have a one of the better coaches in the league. It's different when you feel like the locker room is quitting. When you feel like the locker room is quitting on your coach on its season, you have no choice. You can't salvage that. Rick's been here 13 years. He's the best coach, hands down, in Mavericks history. You know, as much as people want to give credit to, like, Don Nelson, it's it's Carlisle. Not just because he has the one ring, but Carlisle's a very good coach, and something's, uh, something's not working here. Maybe it's how long he's been here and his message falling a little bit on deaf ears. I know some people say, like, hey, man, he hasn't won a playoff series since he won the championship. Yeah, and the Mavericks have snuck into the playoffs a few times, but I don't think they've ever been seeded higher than fifth. I think they had one season, which was the blown up Rondo season, um, where they were the five seed every other year. They were, or maybe they were sixth. I don't remember exactly, but like every other year they've, if they've gotten in the playoffs, they've been seven or eight. You're not going to be favored in those matchups. And yeah, he's got Luca. And that's that's a great, great weapon to have. But you got to have something with roster construction as well. And I know the Mavericks have their kind of holy trinity of decision makers between Cuban, Donnie Nelson, and Carlisle. And that all of them get pretty fair and even input. It's not like Carlisle's being just handed these players. Obviously, Dallas has to acquire them, whether it be through a signing or through a trade. But Carlisle has a major say in it. He talked about when they acquired Josh Richardson, how... He thought four years, which means it could only have been two years, but he thought four years from afar watching Richardson, he would be a perfect pair next to Luka Doncic. And before things got completely undercut by COVID, I think that held true. I think it did. We were talking about uh, Richardson being a potential, you know, long-term extension guy here as your number three. And... I didn't have any complaints with that. I thought that was a great consideration, a great signing that you could do. But here we are. We have to have some tough, tough discussions now. And uh, if things fall off, at the very least, Richardson's in a contract year. He's not earning any big money right now. He had a down year with Philadelphia. And if he has a down year playing next to Luka Doncic... And with Porzingis, even if Porzingis also has a down year after last year, which got hot in the second half of the season, then at that point you do have to have major consideration. Something else to consider on the on the people talking about like, oh, you have to move on from Porzingis. I'm going to have to fix this stupid focus thing. It is all kinds of out of whack. On the people talking about trading Porzingis, if his value is depleted this much and his contract is what it is, why do you think he's tradable right now? Why do you think he has value? If you're getting scraps for him, that doesn't make sense. For him to recoup value, he's going to have to raise his level back at least close to what it was around January of last year or bubble KP, whatever. And if that's the case, if he's playing at that level, you're not trading him anyway. You want him. So I don't know. You know, I've... For some people who saw KP shine in the bubble, but then he had the the setback with the knee, and they were screaming, hey, trade KP now. 
I thought that was ridiculous, and I still think it would have been ridiculous. Now, you can say, hey, hindsight proved they might have been right, but I don't think that's from a basis of knowledge. I think that's just them saying, like, making a blind bet, basically, and saying, you know, hey, I would do this. And when they add to that their argument of, I would take, uh, I would take back less for him than I acquired. I would take a secondary role player for him or a one first round pick if I even got that or something to that effect. When you're talking about taking like 80 cents on the dollar back for what he is and what you could get for him otherwise, that's where I'm like, okay, now you're just being dumb. I'd rather bank on his health and have him than pay out now and take in less for him. If I'm paying out now, it's because I'm somehow getting more for him than I normally would. So there's a whole discussion there, but I think the basis to focus on is just that KP looks lost right now. I do have confidence he will find himself at some point. The question, though, is going to be, can he get there and stay there, be it his confidence, be it his health, whatever. This offense is not the same as last year. The ball moves less. The team in its motion moves less. And right now, it just feels like it's Luka versus the world because not a whole lot else is working. KP's lost. Richardson and them coming back from COVID. They haven't recovered yet. They're not in condition yet to play at the level they need to. And uh, Tim Hardaway Jr. is just a guy out there. He can do something for you sometimes. And when in certain games, he can give you a big game when you really need it. But there's a lot of pieces on this team that I think are decent pieces and maybe all assembled together. They do form like a bit of a Voltron type scenario. But there's a lot of guys here that aren't that aren't parts I'm sold on long term. And again, and again, part of that just comes from you know, being in the moment and feeling what we feel in the moment. Seeing what we see and how this team looks now. But I, I know how good this team can be this year. We saw right before the wheels fell off because of health and safety protocols, that overtime win in Denver. That was a great game. That was a great win. They've had great moments this year. It's just about finding consistency and, uh, you know, as much as we want to say, as you know, as much as we want to point to things like COVID or the tough schedule or KP not being healthy at the start of the year, you, you can't, you can't just brush it off and say, it's all going to come together. We don't know. And how they're playing right now, the problems are certainly bigger than just those things. Here's a cool stat from Tim McMahon as well on Mike Conley. Jimmy and I talked the other day about Conley and how well he's playing this year. He is the NBA's best plus minus at plus 259 and at plus 259 and that is 60 points better than Jazz teammate Rudy Gobert and 84 points better than any other player in the league. Utah's for real. Utah is for real this year. And uh, we'll see what they can do. But I'm not worried about them. I'm worried about the Mavericks figuring some things out because this is hard to watch. And I know for you guys, this is frustrating. And, you know, come come to the channel, jump in the comments, vent your rage. We'll, uh, we'll weather this storm and we'll see where it goes. I still have hope that this team can pull this up out of the gutter and, you know, build towards something, build towards something positive for this year. If not, you know, I still think they are a playoff team this year. I think they recover to that degree, but any notion of them being in the top four, five, even, I mean, that's, that looks hard to see right now. I could see them still making the playoffs, but can you do anything once you get there? How are you playing once you get there? How does the defense look? If the defense isn't better, but the offense is still a step down from last year, why do we think it's going to be better? There's a lot to figure out. And unfortunately, all we can do is wait. 
We have to see how the team responds. They're better than they're playing. We have to see how Carlisle responds. We have to see how the organization responds. Are they going to pull the trigger now on a big trade? I think Cuban and Donnie Nelson should make a major consideration of doing just that if things don't pull out of this tailspin in the next couple of weeks. I think that's the only thing you can do because you need some kind of fresh energy and life in this team. You need really, you need a leader, a strong-willed leader on this team. And uh, if I can't get that right now, I would at least settle for a guy that fixes many of our problems. I mean, again, feel free to speculate in the chat on who you think that would be. But I, I've already talked more about this game. I've already put more effort into this video, frankly, than the Mavericks put into the last two games. I'm not going to go any further than this for now. Hang tight. We'll have more content coming. Uh, like the video. Why not? <laughs> like the video. Help the channel grow. Subscribe. Till next time, remember, every legend was once a prospect.